I I genuinely apologize for being late. Um, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker and I'm used to taxi cabs stopping when you raise your hand. But in Washington, you have a breed of taxi cab driver who um, believes that the way you drive a taxi cab is to hold your cell phone to your ear, look straight ahead, and not stop, <laughs> even when your light is on. And so I was. It took me a lot longer than I expected to get here. I do apologize. And I'm going to turn my cell phone off so I'm not embarrassed by its ringing. Um, well, um, I'm always happy to come to Politics and Prose. Uh, I, have, I never get as good audiences in any bookstore I speak in as in this one. Uh, and uh, as Barbara said, this is the third time I've had the pleasure of speaking here. Um, I came to this book uh, in a peculiar way. Um, I was teaching in Beirut at the American University, as Barbara mentioned. And uh, I was asked to do some re research on Soviet Middle East policy. And I responded, I can't do any research on Soviet Middle East policy. I don't know Russian. And they said, well, have a look at the literature. Just see if you, know, you feel you could make a contribution. And I had a look at the literature. And I realized that most of the people who wrote on Soviet Middle East policy knew nothing about the politics, history, culture, or anything else uh, of the countries of the Middle East. They knew no Middle Eastern languages, by and large. Uh, they worked from the United States or from the Soviet Union. Um, and so I said, well, they're no more ignorant than I am. Uh, they don't know Middle Eastern languages, and I, uh, I never claimed I knew Russian. But um, because of the uh, 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 generosity of our government in translating a huge volume of materials from the Russian current digest of the Soviet press, summary of world broadcasts, which the British translated, um, an English speaker like myself had access to pretty much everything that was ever published in Russia. Uh, uh, all, the public, all the public stuff was there. And I was sitting in Beirut, and I had access to uh, a lot of the Middle Eastern materials. So I started working on this topic. And as I started working on it, I realized that most of the things that are written were not just written by people who didn't know very much about the Middle East. But uh, most of the stuff that was written was written from a perspective which privileged um, the way either Moscow or more often Washington saw things. And as I, as I suggest in this book, I think that's obviously very important, and I treat that with a great deal of attention. But I try in this book to look at how the Cold War impacted the Middle East from a Middle Eastern perspective. What did the Cold War do to the Middle East? What kind of patterns uh, did the Cold War create that we may still be living with? And uh, I think that is the main lesson uh, I took away from my work on this book, that um, a lot of stuff that happened in the Middle East as a result of the Cold War, most of it very negative, some of it not entirely negative, uh, are things that were completely ignored in the way in which the, the Cold War uh, was studied and treated uh, in the Middle East. Uh, by and large, people looked at it in terms of advantage. This worked out to the advantage of the United States, or this didn't, or this worked out to the advantage of the Soviets, or this didn't. Most of these things, incidentally, whether they worked out to the advantage of the United States or the Soviet Union, did not work out to the advantage of most Middle Easterners. And that is one of the major uh, uh, points that I try and make in this book. The competition between the superpowers, whatever it may or may not have done for them, uh, did not have uh, good consequences in many respects for Middle Easterners. There's a chapter in this book where I talk about how conflicts in the Middle East were affected by the Cold War. Uh, they weren't started by the Cold War, but how they were affected. And by and large, they were affected in a very negative fashion. They were exacerbated. They were made worse. They were envenomed. Uh, they were made much, much more uh, uh, violent in some cases. And I deal in particular with the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, uh, the Lebanon War of uh, 1975 to 1990, and the Iran-Iraq War as my case studies. And what I try and show in the, in the chapter that I devote to this is that the superpowers, for reasons that you know, may have seemed perfectly good in Washington or in Moscow, in fact were using uh, these conflicts as means to get at one another. This, in the case of the Arab-Israeli conflict, really started in the 1960s. Before that, the United States and the Soviet Union were on the same side, by and large. In 1948, both of them supported Israel. In 1956, both of them supported Egypt. Um, they were in conflict with one another, but uh, the conflict had not yet become polarized along Cold War lines in the 40s or the 50s. That is what, in fact, happened in the 1960s, and the result was an enormous increase in the level of violence because both sides were getting first-line weapons from their superpower patrons. The war of attrition, uh, the war that was fought after the 67 war from 1968 to 1970, was infinitely more destructive than the 67 war had been. 
in terms of the sheer destructive power of the weaponry, weaponry used. The 1973 war uh, w in involved one of the largest tank battles in history, the largest tank battle since Kursk in 1943, involved huge casualties, is the, the largest number of casualties in any of Israel's wars, um, and very large, very, very extensive damage. Um, my point here is that, the, is that, the, that these, the, these conflicts in the region were in fact made much worse by the way in which they came to track with the Cold War. As uh, in the case of the Arab countries, they came to be aligned with the Soviet Union. In the case of Israel, it came to be aligned with the United States. And I, I argue the same thing in looking at um, both the uh, Lebanon conflict and the uh, Iran-Iraq War. The Iran-Iraq War is probably one of the least honorable uh, case studies uh, in the way in which the Cold War uh, affected Middle Eastern conflicts. Both superpowers supported both combatants at different times during this war. Uh, the United States not only uh, supported Iraq in a variety of ways and encouraged its allies to support Iraq in a variety of ways. The United States also saw to it that uh, anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles were shipped uh, to Iran uh, uh, during the Reagan administration in an extension of what was then known as Iran-Contra. The Soviet Union not only supplied most of the weapons that the Iraqis used, they also supplied a large part of the weapons that the Iranians used. Uh, and they switched sides uh, quite frequently. And I go back and talk about how this affected this American-Soviet involvement, not just in the, in the eight-year Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s, but in earlier phases of uh, conflict uh, between Iran and Iraq involved not just this kind of cynical support for one an, or another power, but involved a variety of people in the Middle East getting, as it were, trampled underfoot. And I point out how the Kurds, for example, suffered uh, from the way in which the Soviet Union used them and then dropped them and used them and then dropped them, and from the way in which the United States at different times used them and then dropped them. I quote, uh, a horrified aide to Sec then, then uh, Secretary of State Kissinger uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, exclaiming uh, that the United States had abandoned uh, the Kurds after the 1975 Algiers Agreement when uh, uh, the Shah of Iran and, and uh, Saddam Hussein uh, came to an accord over, over their border dispute and suddenly uh, Iranian, American, and Israeli Kur support for the Kurds stopped. And Kissinger replied to this horrified aid, uh, covert action should not be confused with missionary work. Um, and this is an example. I, I cite other examples of similar cynicism on the part of the Soviet Union. This is an example of how small peoples, uh, how uh, small countries uh, got caught up uh, in the Cold War. I talk in another chapter about how the Cold War uh, had an impact on democracy in this region. Now let me start by saying something about a widely held myth about the Middle East, and it's something I talked about in an earlier book of mine, Resurrecting Empire, and this is that there never was democracy in the Middle East. This is that the Middle East is a region that has always been plagued by autocracy or authoritarian government. And um, there's a kernel of truth to this, in that certainly since the 60s or the 70s, the Middle East has been a black hole where democracy is concerned. And inasmuch as the Middle East is where strong, centralized, autocratic government first developed, before any other part of the world had agriculture, cities, states, empires, centralized governments, for several thousand years, the Middle East had all of these things. So the first powerful centralized governments developed in the uh, Mesopotamian river valleys and in Egypt thousands of years before they developed anywhere else except possibly China. Um, so there is a tradition of strong autocratic states in the Middle East. And it is true that for the last few decades, the Middle East has been plagued uh, by uh, uh, what we can kindly call a democratic deficit. But, but this is also a region in which there was an enormous effort to try and uh, 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 bring about a transition to democracy. This is a region in which there were attempts to establish constitutional governments, and in fact, constitutional governments were established long before they were established in Spain, in Portugal, in most countries of Eastern Europe. The Ottoman Constitution of 1876, the Iranian Constitution of 1906, are examples of a desire to see limits on the power of the executive, a desire to see some form of representative government, uh, of constitutional government. So it is also a region which has a tradition of at least 
certain forces in those societies struggling to achieve some form of democratic government. And in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, from the Sudan to in, into the 50s, from the Sudan to Egypt to Lebanon to Syria to Jordan to Iraq to Iran, you had democratic governments. 